Well, as you know now, today our topic is balancing grief and joy, and I loved um, the Mark Nepo reading uh, that Louise did because it really goes um, hand in glove with, with the way I see balancing uh, grief and joy. Um, because when I first thought, saw this topic, I thought about Meister Eckhart, who delineated four pathways through which we are deepened spiritually. And two of those four are the via positiva, which is called sometimes the path of light, and the via negativa, which is the path of interiority. So today we're going to look at via positiva and via negativa as our balance of grief and joy. Um, and as paths to our own spiritual, deepening of our spirituality. Um, the via positivity is the way in which we see ourselves and the world around us as blessings. That we were meant to enjoy this life because we were birthed from love and joy. We might treat the via positiva as the way we view the breadth of life, the magnificence of it. Uh, and our place within it, the songs of the birds, as, as, as Louise talked about. It's a, um, it's a call to celebration. While via negativa, tiva, via negativa is a call to honor the mystery or the roots of our being. The via positiva calls us to, to the light of our own magnificence. The via negativa asks us to explore the depth of who we are. Matthew Fox, in his book, Original Blessings, says that both the via negativa and the via positiva are necessary for our understanding, and we can't have one without the other. He says the depth of nothingness is directly related to the experience of everythingness. We learn we are cosmic beings not only in our joy and our ecstasy, but also in our pain and sorrow. And if you remember Kilbron, I mean, I, I think, I know Rosie, this is one of the, Rosie's favorites, you can't know the, the, the height of your joy until you've known the depth of your despair, because that's what carves deep so that you can fill it with all that beauty. Um, so today we're going to explore how we can balance grief and joy by letting go of images. That's going to be the first one. And, and letting pain be pain. <laughs> um, letting go of images. Two birds of golden plumage sat on the same tree. The one above, serene, majestic, immersed in his own glory. The one below, restless, eating the fruits of the tree, now sweet, now bitter. Once when he ate an exceptionally bitter fruit, he paused and looked up at the majestic bird above him. But then he forgot about the other bird and went on eating the fruit. Again he ate a bitter fruit, and this time he hopped up a few boughs near the bird at the top. This happened many times until at last, the lower bird came to the place of this upper bird and lost himself. He suddenly discovered that there had never been two birds, but that he was all the time that upper bird, serene, majestic, immersed in his own glory. So this story portrays, obviously, the, that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. We experience the sweetness of life and its bitterness, yet there is something profound at our core that is serene, majestic, and immersed in our own glory. And we find that core in meditation. This is where we let go of images. You know, we can't let go of the image of a pink elephant in our heads by trying to let go of the image of the pink elephant. It'll just get bigger, you know, <laughs> that's the way it works. So rather, the chattering monkeys slow down and st sometimes stop when we relax breathe deep, and allow ourselves to become with our, one with our own heartbeat. Often it helps to count, breathe in a count of four, 
breathe out on account of four. And when images cross our mind, just let them blow through gently like clouds, returning again to the breathing and counting. And we stopped, if we start small, five to 10 minutes, and gradually increase that to 20 or 30 minutes, we will someday, soon, find the chattering monkeys are much more still. And we begin to have a sense that there is no place where the innermost part of us and the outermost part of us are separate. And that's when we let go of the biggest image of all, <laughs> the image of ourselves. And several years ago, I read a delightful book by Douglas Harding. It was called On Having No Head. He had an experience when he was 33 and walking in the Himalayas. And it's so cute that I'd like to uh, tell you of his experience in his own words. What actually happened was something absurdly simple and unspectacular. Just for the moment, I stopped thinking. Reason and imagination and all mental chatter died down. For once, words failed me. I forgot my name, my humanness, my thingness, all that could be called me or mine, past and present, dropped away. It was as if I had been born that instant, brand new, mindless, innocent of all memories. There existed only the now, that present moment, and what was clearly given in it. To look was enough. And what I found was khaki trouser legs terminating downward in a pair of brown shoes, khaki sleeves terminated sideways in a pair of pink hands, and a khaki shirt front terminating upwards in absolutely nothing, nothing whatsoever, certainly not in a head. It took me no time at all to notice that this nothing, this hole where a head should be, was no ordinary vacancy. On the contrary, it was very much occupied. It was a vast emptiness, vastly filled, a nothing that found room for everything, room for grass, trees, shadowy distant hills, and far above them the snow peaks like a row of angular clouds riding the blue sky. I had lost a head and gained a world. It was all quite literally breathtaking. I seemed to stop breathing altogether, absorbed in the given. Here it was, this superb scene, brightly shining in the clear air, alone and unsupported, mysteriously suspended in the void, and utterly free of me, unstained by any observer. Its total presence was my total absence, body and soul, lighter than air, clearer than glass, altogether released from myself, I was nowhere around. There arose no question, no reference beyond the experience itself, but only peace and a quiet joy and the sensation of having dropped an intolerable, intolerable burden. Yeah, I identify with Mr. Harding because I had a very similar experience when I lived in California. I was floating on a pool chair in my backyard pool, and for a moment my body was gone. It just wasn't there, and I was no longer watching the trees, the butterflies. I was no longer listening to the, to the bees or sensing the cool water. For a moment, I was all of those things. I was the experience, and there was no me. And what I can tell you is from that experience, what happened over 45 years ago, um, I found by having no me that I was more me than I had ever been in my life. <laughs> so so I, really, I really can hold hands with, with Mr. Harding. Um, so from that experience, I gained a, a sincere trust of the universe. I've had similar experiences of this kind, but that was the most profound. And like, for, and like Mr. Harding, it was superbly simple and unspectacular. Just for the moment, I stopped thinking. And I'm sure the mystics of the ages have often had these experiences, but just one can stay with you for a lifetime. Uh, Mr. Harding published his book at 91, 
and he had had that experience 60 years before. Um, so when through meditation and quiet contemplation we let go of images, we come to trust more and criticize less. We come to the world where the fruit is both bitter and sweet with a more empathic heart. And we savor those moments when we embrace the depth of our being. The second one we're going to talk about is letting pain be pain. The exploration of our own interiority is often set in motion by pain, psychological or physical. Um, we've all lived long enough to experience some kind of a dark night of the soul when we felt lost, when we felt in pain, when we felt that grief. And coming out of that dark night, we've found that, our, that we've been transformed. We've become someone we never would have become had we not had that experience. And that is, in essence, the via negativa, for it asks us to dive down to those deepest parts of us and from that place find God and find a new starting place for ourselves. Khalil Gibran in The Prophet says, your pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. Even as the stone of the fruit must break, that its heart may stand in the sun, so must you know pain. And could you keep your heart in wonder at the daily miracles of your life? Your pain would not seem less wondrous than your joy. And you would accept the seasons of your heart, even as you have always accepted the seasons that pass over your fields. And you would watch with serenity through the winters of your grief. You know, our Western culture has taught us to fear pain, um, to get rid of it immediately. All we have to do is uh, <laughs> watch a TV program and stay around for the commercials. I mean, there's more commercials than there is picture, you know. <laughs> and they're all about how we can stop some kind of a pain. You know, ask your doctor about whatever it is. But I am going to check into Ozempic because you're supposed to lose weight on it. <laughs> and I, I really, I do celebrate that we have so many medical advances and that we do need to take advantage of them. But sometimes I wonder if we wouldn't do well to just take a few minutes and sit with the pain. Just sit with it. You know, I had a wonderful practitioner. She was, she was teaching at age 103. <laughs> um, and she taught me to sit with pain, both physical and emotional. She had some kind of a crippling illness uh, before, I had, before I met her, and it seemed to have no cure. And there were days that she couldn't even get out of bed. She was beginning the studies in the science of mind and sometimes would simply throw the textbook across the room because nothing she did seemed to be working. Then one day, she simply breathed into the pain. And she used the phrase, right where the pain is, God is, over and over as a mantra as she kept breathing deeply. And the pain began to subside. And as she continued to use this statement and breathe every time the pain appeared, eventually it subsided completely. Right where the pain is, God is. Right where the pain is, God is. In our culture, we're encouraged to take antidepressants at the drop of a hat. Again, I wonder if sometimes we might find ourselves more honored by simply sitting with the depression. I don't like that label, but sitting with whatever that dark time is. And perhaps we could watch with serenity through the winters of our depression if we weren't so quick to circumvent the pain that brought us there. You know, I talk, all, I talk a lot about the caterpillar, I think I did last week. He takes into the cocoon everything he needs to be the butterfly but there has to be a complete breakdown and reforming in the darkness for that transformation to take place. And I think that those dark nights that feel like depression 
maybe are coming into our own soup-like consistency, breaking down before we can become that butterfly. Poet uh, David White says this so beautifully in his poem, The Well of Grief. I love David White. I can't, I can't do his poetry the way he does it, but I love his words. Those who will not slip beneath the still surface on the well of grief, turning down to its black water, to the place that we cannot breathe, will never know the source from which we drink the secret water cold and clear, nor find in the darkness the small gold coins thrown by those who wished for something else. I'm not telling anybody to stop taking pills. Please don't, <laughs> please don't do that. <laughs> but I do suggest if we ask our pain, or emotional or physical, what message are you bringing me? We might find an answer that transcends pain. Matthew Fox says the purpose of letting pain be pain is precisely this, to let go of pain. Ideally, by entering into it, we become able to breathe so much freedom from within the pain that the deepest kind of letting go can truly occur. As we have our human experiences, some of them do bring pain and others do bring joy. And I believe it is the embracing of all experiences as spiritual that we find blessings in both joy and pain. I believe it takes a willingness and true courage on our part to allow our dark nights to be our teacher. And I, ta I believe it takes both willingness and discipline to create and engage in a spiritual practice that puts us in touch with the core of our being. What we find then in the blending or the balancing of the via positiva and the via ne negativa is the balance of joy with grief and a profound trust in the universe, in God, and in ourselves. The Via Positiva invites us to trust our divinity, partici participating in a cosmic banquet that is ours by divine birthright. The ne Via Negativa invites us into the darkness, the mystery, and to trust the darkness, knowing that it is the source from which we drink that secret water, cold and clear. From both of these paths, then, we keep our hearts in wonder at the daily miracles of our life, accepting the seasons of our heart as we accept the seasons that pass over our fields. Thank you. Namaste.